Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people, and this is my 500th interview. Um, hey. So, and the person who gets the honors for that is Danny Antman. Uh, welcome, Danny. Hi, I didn't know I was number 500. That's you wonderful. Are. Yeah. Yay. Too bad we're not doing this in Indianapolis. <laughs> <laughs> um, Buddha, I just want to add that my name is Rick Archer. Forgot to say that last week. And Buddha the Gas Pump is um, supported by appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to make a contribution, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. We're registered as a nonprofit, a 501c3. Um, Danny is an internationally known energy healer and interfaith minister who now lives in Santa Barbara, California. She's been at the forefront of energy medicine and healing since 1992 when she graduated from the Barbara Brennan School of Healing. She's a graduate of the School for Non-Dual Healing and Awakening, um, which was founded by Jason Shulman, who has been on Bad Gap, and she taught there for over nine years. She's led workshops at the Esalen Institute, La Casa de Maria, and the Lionheart Institute for Transpersonal Energy Healing. She's a somatic experiencing pr practitioner and helps people recover from the effects of trauma and PTSD. Um, this next part is the bit that excites me the most. She has received spiritual direction and assistance for over 17 years from Patanjali Kundalini Yoga Care Center. Um, I had Joan Shivarpita ha Harrigan on the show a number of years ago, and I must say that from everything I know about that center, it's one of the most effective things that has been presented on this show. It's not for the masses. They have a very select few who uh, attend it, but they, those few receive very personalized guidance, and everyone I've spoken to who has gone there has received tremendous benefits from it. So, Danny's been involved with that for over 17 years, and <clears throat> through this guidance, she completed a, a challenging kundalini process related to her Jewish past. We'll be talking about that during the interview. She's dedicated to guiding others on their spiritual path. Okay, so welcome, Danny. Thank you. Good to do this. In, in fact, you know, I didn't even know that you had any relationship to Joan Harrigan and the Patanjali Kundalini Center until about a week ago when I started actually preparing for this interview. I didn't know it when we invited you, so it was a real pleasant surprise to discover that. I thought that's how I got invited. No, it so. wasn't. I, we just <laughs> okay. thought, okay, she looks interesting, but I, somehow, I did, at least in my mind, I didn't make that connection, and I was really happy to see it. Yeah. I've had a kind of unusual process because it combines two paths, one uh, of Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical path, and the other uh, Kundalini science. And um, I wouldn't say that they are the same paths, but somehow they're, they have been working simultaneously within me. And it's been a very gradual awakening process in contrast to some of the people I've heard on your show where, you know, it's an all of a sudden big bang. My process has been, you know, over quite, quite a amount of, long amount of time. Yeah, you know, but even the all of a sudden big bang people end up going through years and years and years of integration, purification, you know, processing of stuff. Uh, they might start out with a bang, but that's definitely not the end of the story. Right, right. It's kind of misleading sometimes. And um, when I first moved to California from New York City, I was already in Kundalini process and I, I moved to Northern California first. And it was a hub where I lived for all the Neo Advaita teachers that were going around the country. And I remember sitting there and one woman who was speaking said there was absolutely no such thing as purification, you know, and blah, 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 blah. And I was in a raging purification process at the time. So it was hard to, um, you know, put together all the pieces for some time. But yeah. that's what I'd like to talk about today. Yeah, you know, this uh, year at the SAND conference, I'm going to do a talk on the fact that knowledge is different at different levels of consciousness and di different levels of reality. And, you know, there's a level at which that woman is right. You know, there's no mm -hmm. purification, but at that level, there's also no universe. Um, or no you and yeah. no you, which they no, all nothing. say. Right. But it's not that helpful for people, you know, going through struggles. And 
I work as an energy healer and counselor, and I have found it really important to meet people where they are. And too much information from a different state of being or level of consciousness is not useful at a certain time. Yeah, you should always teach to the level of consciousness of the, of the student, otherwise you're talking over each other and nobody's, there's no connection. Or perhaps slightly higher, so you have slightly something higher. to- Slightly higher. Yeah, you don't yeah. pander to their level of, to their ignorance, if, if, if we want to use that harsh term. But you have to speak in a way that they can absorb something and relate to something. I mean, for instance, you know, a lot of people who awake and say, I always knew this, you know, this, this enlightenment thing is nothing new. This was, you know, how could I have overlooked it? And yeah, that's true. But then if they turn around and start saying to everyone, you're already enlightened, you don't need to do anything, that's not helpful. Right. And I still hear a lot of that on the various, you know, shows that I listen to or podcasts. Yeah. I think it's starting to fizzle out, you know, because a lot of people have just gotten fed up with that message and realized it wasn't working. Even, the, even many of the people who were teaching it and saying it began to realize that they needed a more embodied, integrated kind of approach even for their own life, what to say of their, the lives of the people they purported to teach. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, we, we nailed the neo-advitans. Um, <laughs> why don't we uh, retrace our steps a little bit? Because your, your life has had a number of rather distinct chapters. And, it, and, and those chapters are reflected in the chapters of your book, which is called Wired for God. Let me just show it on the screen here for a second. Um, there it is, Wired for God. Um, so why don't, we, we want to apportion our time here because there's a lot of stuff you and I could talk about. And, you know, we don't necess it won't necessarily be the most useful thing to spend most of our time talking about some of those early chapters of your life. But let's run through them because it'll kind of set the stage for where you've ended up with all this. Yeah, um, I should say I grew up in New York and I grew up um, at the edge of the 1960s. I was born in 56 and it wasn't until I started writing the story that I actually realized how tumultuous uh, those times were and its effect on me. Um, I also grew up 10 years after the end of World War II. And it took me a long time to realize that the Judaism that I inherited was a shattered Judaism. And my parents uh, brought me up secularly, not religiously. And um, my mother wanted to be more American than Jewish because of World War II. And my father had kind of given up his Jewish observances that he was uh, brought up with. Where were your so parents during the war? Uh, they were in the United States, okay. but um, everybody was affected. And sure. anybody who was Jewish was certainly affected by yeah. the war. And then also, um, you know, I was 13 in 1969, a little too young to go to Woodstock, <laughs> but most of my friends were going to Woodstock. And even though I was 13, I had 15 year old friends who were already doing LSD. Um, I started smoking pot really young. Um, so the times were really tumultuous. Um, the Vietnam War was on TV every single night. And I didn't realize how much I numbed out just seeing that, mm. um, kind of shut down and numbed out. And the threat to the young men who were just slightly older than me was that they were going to be drafted in a few years and go off to the jungles of Vietnam. So even though my childhood was basically normal um, and I had loving parents, there was still kind of a underlying... Um, anxiety, I guess, about growing up in those times. And in my own home, around the time of coming of age, 13, my parents were go going through a major um, emotional and financial battle with my grandparents that affected all of us kids. I have a brother and a sister very much. So things, you know, on the outside look normal, but they really weren't. I was slightly depressed. I didn't know how to launch myself in the world. Um, so tumultuous times, and I was very interested in esoteric things at a pretty young age. I was reading all of Carlos Castaneda when those books came out. I was fascinated by the states. Everybody was, I guess, yeah, that yeah. read them. 
Um, I long to go find Don Juan myself, his teacher, and <laughs> be an apprentice. Um, uh, so later on, many, many years later, um, when I found the teachings of Barbara Brennan, you know, that really resonated with me because she had a school that purported to teach how to see into bodies, how to um, see into energy fields, how to use them for the purposes of healing. Um, but I'm skipping ahead a little bit. I was an artist for many years in New York City. And um, I eventually ended up as an artist for interior designers. I had my own business. So I spent a good, I don't know, 14 years of my early life working really hard, um, being a freelance artist, um, leading a kind of wild and promiscuous life in New York City, party girl. Um, not thinking much about spirituality. Um, and by the time I was 30 years old, kind of a switch flipped and I thought, well, you know, you better settle down, think about getting married, all, you know, what are you doing with your life? Um, and... One interesting thing I heard you say about your art period was that um, it demanded great focus. You were doing architectural, interior architectural design for architects and um, sometimes you had to pull all nighters to get a project done on deadline and and you would just go into this deep deep focus and it, it sort of cultured a certain ability in you that that kind of had some uh, advantages later on yeah there's a, a lot of artists have that focus musicians have that focus you know you could call it the zen of art the zen of music and there were times when I stayed up all night and I was really in the zone. There was no thinking involved with the painting I was doing. It was like one big gesture that came out of me after a period of um, time. And um, it's very similar to meditation um, or the concentration you would need to do a healing uh, with energy work. Um, the, the other thing I would say about those times is um, I started out in interior. I started out as a painter. I switched to interior design, and I became a renderer. My freelance work was doing interior design renderings. But in design school, um, I had two very progressive teachers, and they would give us projects where we would have to deconstruct the nature of reality to do the project. For example, to design a bathroom. We were given books of, uh, like by Alan Watts, the Tao of something or other, I don't remember. <laughs> and um, it was a deconstructive process um, in order to get to like the essence of water to design a bathroom. And I was 19 years old and I remember getting very depressed. It, it's not that I didn't understand the assignment, I did, but I didn't have a self yet. You know, I was very insecure, I was very young. And I couldn't handle that kind of deconstructive process. Um, so in hindsight, I realized I got depressed because I didn't have a self and they were trying to deconstruct a self I didn't have. Um, so it was interesting to reflect upon that much later from a spiritual standpoint. Yeah, did you go to Pratt by any chance? I went to the New York School of Interior Design. Okay, my parents met at Pratt. My father was a professional <laughs> artist. Um, yeah, so when you say you didn't have a self, uh, what that, what I understand you to be saying is that I've heard various people say that, you know, some teachers say, well, you have to sort of kill the ego or deconstruct the ego or whatever. But others, I think perhaps more wisely say, well, you really have to have a strong, healthy ego before you can consider deconstructing it. And I think what you're saying when you didn't have one yet is you hadn't developed a strong, healthy one yet, right? Right. I, I hadn't individuated yet. I was still living at home. Um, I was very young in a way to be doing interior design where you're supposed to be telling other people how they should design their houses. I never ended up doing that. <laughs> I was never comfortable with it. So. Okay. So um, Barbara Brennan. So what you, you touched upon Barbara Brennan and you really got heavily into that. And actually, I heard you say in another interview that uh, at a certain, right around the time that um, computer-aided design came out and put you out of a job, the, you were ready to pick up healing full time and had gained some facility with it um, as a result of your training with Barbara Brennan. Yeah, but it came as a shock to me that I would even do that. Um, at the time, I had 
been interested in channeling and other esoteric things. I wouldn't have called myself um, overtly spiritual. Um, and I passed a flyer on a bus stop one day that said um, there was a channeler offering, offering sessions in New York. And at the time I was about to get married, I was 32, I was settling down, I had a good career. And when I went to this channeler to find out about my upcoming marriage, really, um, she told me I was a healer and I had no idea what that was, nor any conception of doing that. And she told me to get a book about it. So um, I actually had to go to a bookstore to do that. There was no Amazon. <laughs> there were no computers, 1988. And Barbara Brennan had just published her book, Hands of Light. And I think I read three chapters and it felt like lightning was running through my body. I was so excited by what she presented that you could see underneath reality to an underlying energy to the subtle body. And um, of course it seemed like magic, but she said in her book, she could train people to do this. And despite the fact that it was so outside of my normal um, expectation of myself, I signed up for a four year training. And um, at 32, I think I was one of the youngest people in the class. Um, it was it mainly attracted people who had been around a while, you know, who were different kinds of practitioners. I had never been in therapy. I had never done any inner work. And much to my surprise, the first lesson was, if you're going to be a healer, you have to heal yourself. And I thought I was just fine as I was. <laughs> and um, the four years there, opened up uh, Pandora's box in terms of looking inside to one's own psyche, one's own conditioning, um, my own psychology. So in order to work with people, I really had to understand um, my own proclivities, my own conditioning. Um, and at 32, I was ready, ready to handle that. Um, and I started therapy. We were all required to be in therapy and we were required to get supervision, which is a credit to Barbara's um, integrity, actually. That's interesting. And so how long did you, uh, so you, you went through the four years of training and you became a professional healer. And um, you might mention some of the experiences you had during that training and during your healing practice, because you definitely um, cultured or developed subtle perception and certain abilities and all, which, you know, may be somewhat tangential to awakening or enlightenment, but I think are kind of in the, in the orbit of, of re that kind of realization. Many enlightened people have them, but many unenlightened people can also develop them and develop them. Right. And, and more importantly, I think one of the things I've learned since is the importance of the subtle body um, in the awakening process itself. And that came about later through Swamiji and Joan. So let's defend, um, let's define what the subtle body is. I don't know if it, yeah. everyone necessarily accepts that there is one. And uh, I've heard people say, for instance, some well-known uh, teachers that, well, there's no self. And therefore, for instance, reincarnation couldn't happen because there's nothing to reincarnate. Um, so I happen to disagree. And uh, I think and it, the reason that reincarnation and other things can happen is that there is a subtle body which, which persists even when the gross body dies. So anyway, let's talk about that a little bit. Right. I mean, I think it exists, but it is possible that when you're finally liberated, the subtle body dissolves and then there's no self, no subtle body and you don't reincarnate. So perhaps it is true from, again, one level of um, attainment. But as far as I can tell, everything in this world of duality has an energy field that surrounds and interpenetrates it. And it is very palpable. Um, human beings experience it daily in a very natural way. When you meet somebody with negative energy and you want to kind of just pull back and move away versus you sit in the field of um, some of the big beings that have been on our planet, you can feel that. You can feel the largeness of their energy field or the potency or the unification within their energy field. 
you can feel it around plants and stones. Um, and in a human being, we were trained um, to perceive and um, feel seven, six layers of the auric field. Um, it's the same as the yogic sheaths. Um, so there are discernible layers, but they interpenetrate each other. So you'd have to be trained to kind of put your attention and focus on a specific level. Um, for instance, there's an astral level. And when people talk about astral things, you can perceive astral beings on the astral level. Um, so, and you can perceive past lives um, on the astral level. Um, real or not real, you know, again, depends on your vantage point. Yeah. Uh, or useful or not useful, you know, a lot of this right. stuff could probably be a distraction. Um, but, you know, if we really want to understand the topology of the universe and, you know, how it's all structured, it might be interesting to have at least a passing understanding of that stuff, even if you don't dwell on it, you know, obsessively. And also with regard to, um, you know, enlightened people having the subtle body dissolve uh, when they die as well as the gross body, probably that happens to some. I mean, Maybe that happens. I don't know. Yeah, from what I've gathered. But then again, there are so many stories, and even you say uh, that the um, the ancient Jewish lineage has some, had somehow inspired or blessed you in, in some way. So maybe those guys are actually hanging around on some level in some sort of body, you know, intervening also, in human affairs. Yeah, and even Ramana you can reach on the other planes. Oh, there's so Swamiji's many people who've had experiences around. of him, yeah. And I've had experiences of Ananda Maima since I um, went to see her in, in her, her ashram. She's no longer in the body. Um, so it's interesting. So, yeah, in the training, um, these levels became very real for me, as real as, as, real as I am. <laughs> so, as real as the dream world is real, it's real. And we worked and I, we worked on them or in them. And, you know, I saw a lot of healing miracles. Um, and at one point, um, I had my own um, physical healing through a series of healings that Jason Shulman, um, I went to Jason Shulman for a series of healings on a, a problem I had with cervical dysplasia. And at that time, he was still, um, I think he had, he also went to Barbara Brennan's School of Healing. I don't know if he mentioned that. But at that point, I think he was already practicing and um, he was one of the teachers there. So um, my doctor documented the healing, you know, after a series of three to six, maybe three or four healings um, and homeopathy, the condition went away by itself. Hmm. A question came in relevant to this from um, Michael Pontilias in the Philippines. He asks, um, how does distance healing work? How does, what, how's, what are the mechanics of it? Yeah, I currently do distance healing. I work on Skype. Um, the mechanics of it are, I talk to people. It's a relational thing. I don't do distant healing without knowing the person, or I, I don't do distant healing on people that haven't asked for healing. Those are my my conditions. But I talk to the person on Skype, and once we've kind of pinpointed the um, area that we want to address, uh, we hang up, and I simply imagine them on my healing table. And I'm very adept at connecting long distance at this point, so I can perceive the subtle body long distance, and I transmit energy through my hands as if they're in my room. And it never fails that when we talk afterwards, um, they know exactly when I've stopped. It's, it's receivable, it's experienceable. And a lot of times when we share what I've perceived and they've experienced, there's a matchup in some form. Mm -hmm. How do you account for the fact that, you know, sometimes healing doesn't work? Uh, even among, you, you mentioned someone who had been very involved with Barbara's school, who yeah. was one of the star students who ended up dying of cancer. So none of the, none of you in that school, including Barbara, I guess, was able to help her. Do you take it as sort of like certain karma is sort of insurmountable or that we have certain destiny and we shouldn't, in some cases, try to circumvent it with a healing? It's a good question. I um, read that years later, Barbara already knew that that person was not going to make it like the day she heard about the person's illness. 
So I didn't know that till recently. Um, yeah, if you believe in karma, we could say it's karma um, or life lessons or the soul's just meant to go through this journey in that particular way. And equally, why does it work? You know, why do people have miraculous healings even without energy work? You know, some people have had miraculous healings, recovery from cancer, and science doesn't know why, but it certainly has been documented that that happens. Um, I have noticed, though, with people um, that no matter what is plaguing you, there are always life lessons to be learned and how you respond to that. And that's usually what I work with with people. You know, what's what can we mine from this situation? What's the lesson? Yeah. Okay. Have we done justice to your healing phase? Um, I would just say that um, learning about the subtle body was was so important for me because it was as if someone could really tell the truth uh, beyond the facade of a person. We, you know, Barbara Brennan's um, vision was quite amazing. I don't think I've ever met anybody that clairvoyant, and it is one of the cities, but. That being said, <laughs> if you were read by her, you felt completely seen. And when you feel completely seen, um, you open up and there's a kind of inner understanding you can get about your own life, how the, all the pieces fit together on the emotional, physical, mental levels. And you feel whole again because of that percept uh, being perceived that way. And I think that's really important that wholeness involves all the parts, the broken parts and the um, the light-filled parts. So that was just the very beginning of dipping my toe in the waters of um, kind of perceiving people from a very integrated place. Yeah, kind of a precursor to what you did later on with Swamiji and all, because that had a lot to do with subtle body and subtle physiology and all. Right. Yeah. Do you think that... Um, Everybody has an aptitude for that sort of thing, the subtle the healing ability and the subtle perception and all, or do you think it's a kind of a, a skill like musical ability that some people have more than others? I would say both. Um, I always wondered why it came so easily to me, and I think that relates to the kind of Kundalini rising I had. Um, I think everybody can learn some subtle sense perception. Um, but just like you said, with music, not everybody is talented or will really open up in that way. Yeah. And that not everybody needs to, perhaps, because, right. you know, ver variety is the spice of life and all. Um, so Kundalini Rising, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. We'll, ex we'll explain what that is and everything. Um, okay. So shall we move on to the next chapter? Yeah, which would be uh, maybe Kabbalah? Or sure. Or yeah. There's also Sananda in there in, in the notes you sent me. Yeah, yeah, we were going to talk about that. Um, mm -hmm. A little cringeworthy episode <laughs> of my nascent uh, spiritual development. Sometime after, right during the end of my training at Barbara Brennan, um, I had just read Autobiography of a Yogi, I think, and um, had gotten interested in yoga. And my current yoga teacher, a uh, private teacher, had a friend who was bringing someone into town. This man I call Sananda in the book. Um, that wasn't who, really his name. Oh. No. <laughs> who claimed to be a yogi and a healer. Um, and I was married at the time, and my then husband and I went to a introductory session. And I became immediately enamored of this person who seemed to have a lot of charisma and present himself as somebody who could take your karma and relieve you of your karma, teach you a, you know, a form of healing. Um, he had a lot of confidence in himself. And more than that, there was um, a transmission of energy that was quite powerful. Um, and because I was in energy healing training, I was pretty impressed with that. It was um, 
permeated his transmissions, permeated the room, affected my energy body um, in a kind of excitatory way, like vibra vibrational way. Um, and I signed up for training with him parallel to that time in Barbara Brennan's. And on the first um, weekend of training that I did, during an exit interview, which was just one-on-one, -on -one, um, he was transmitting Shakti, I guess, into my third eye, along with the Bija mantras in Sanskrit, which um, caused a lot of energy to move through my system. Very impressive. And um, at the end of that transmission, he leaned over and kissed me. And I was like, wow, what's going on here? Um, but I was a little shocked and didn't know how to respond. And then he said, you know, dismiss me. And rather than running at that time, <laughs> running away, which would have been a better response, um, I stayed and completed a couple of years of um, retreats with him. And even though that never happened again, there was a constant astral seduction happening. Um, usually when I was going to bed at night at home, he wasn't even in the country, but it was very palpable, very, very, very seductive. Um, it felt like, I don't know, very delicious sexually charged energy uh, coming into my body. And it was consistent over a period of years and um, very addicting, um, very stimulating and very addicting. And um, during those years, my marriage pretty much fell apart, not because of that. It didn't get off to a very good start anyway. So I, I was a very vulnerable um, novice, spirit, you know, novice practitioner who got very seduced by, by the energy and power of this charismatic person. Um, and some years later, maybe four, three or four years later, um, when I was already separated, um, I had a sexual encounter with him. It was a one-time thing. And it blew apart in less than 24 hours when I found out that he was onto the next person in the group. So he was a serial seducer of women. And um, I didn't find out how, how widespread that was till much later. Um, and I crashed, crashed and burned really quickly. I, I felt humiliated and ashamed and entered into um, a three-year process of therapy looking at my own shadow. And um, I didn't know, again, about my Kundalini rising at that time, um, but I was very vulnerable um, because of the way the energies ran in my own system to someone like him very sensitive, very vulnerable to that kind of seduction. Um, and I've since forgiven myself, but it took a lot of work to look at my own shadow and to kind of repair the pieces of my broken heart um, and disillusionment. And also I felt, um, we were talking about Mother Mira a little bit earlier, um, I felt very invaded, like I couldn't get him out of my energy system for quite some time. And um, about a year after uh, that had happened, I went to Germany to see Mother Mira and had a dream experience in which she helped me clear um, the remnants of that encounter out of my system. It was quite profound and it was gone after that dream encounter. I went to her in a dream and she worked on me and um, after that i was clear again that's astral level but it yeah. did something yeah do you have any conclusions or observations about teachers like that who have a lot of charisma and are radiating shakti and all that business and yet behave that way yeah be careful who you ask for to be your teacher um i think it's a real abuse of the power of the teacher even though i was complicit in the encounter um, you know, it's not good. I wouldn't really recommend it. At the time, I was so overwhelmed with lust that in a way I needed to see it to its end to see through, through that. Um, so in a way that was a good thing for me, but I know people, um, that would never have recovered from that and never gotten back on this, you know, on a spiritual path. 
they would have denounced all spiritual teachers and all, you know, just said no more of that for me. Um, I was lucky in that I had really good helpers and um, it put me on a better course, but I wouldn't recommend teachers who are seducing their students. It's a violation of boundaries and power. Yeah, you know? yeah I know people who have gotten disillusioned like that and have kind of given up on the whole thing and even some cases of suicide and stuff. So it's a pretty sad situation. The only reason I wrote about it is because in the years since people have come to me for help with the very same issues. And it's still rampant amongst, you know, certain spiritual teachers. And I still hear stories about that. And it really hurts people. You know, it's, I don't see where the good is basically in, in any of that. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm resisting the temptation to get out of my soapbox here, but um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we could just say that you have a set of integrity uh, principles for teachers that people should look at, maybe yeah. if they're curious about what they are. Right. And if you're looking for a spiritual teacher, you know, look for integrity. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay, let's um, let's get on, on to the Kabbalah chapter of your life. Which is still going on, but um, you it's know, still going next on. Next topic, and, yeah. Yeah, I should say first, um, I was very drawn to the Kabbalah because. What is of, Kabbalah? Let's define that. Yeah, we'll yeah. start with that. It simply the the word Kabbalah simply means to receive, to receive the wisdom of the Jewish mystical tradition, and um, it's not one book or one path that you could just pick up and follow. It's a collection of teachings, uh, probably stemming back to the time of Abraham. And these teachings have been built upon and expounded upon uh, by different rabbi sages over the years. Um, it was originally a very hidden oral tradition and only passed on from disciple, uh, teacher to disciple one-on-one. -on -one. And I think it started to get written down in the Middle Ages, like 11, 12, 1300s. And um, even then it was a very, it was available to only a select few. So that um, even today, many Jews today just don't know anything about Kabbalah. It's still sort of off to the side and it's certainly gotten more known in today's world, but um, it's not common knowledge, it's esoteric knowledge. Hidden, hidden knowledge. And um, when Jason Shulman um, announced that he was starting a training rooted in the Kabbalah, I was really excited to learn about it. And not only that, he had found a way to use um, the teachings of Kabbalah as a way, a path of awakening and healing. And um, I would say it was a very unconventional um, way of learning Kabbalah because most of us who came to that very first training, I was in his first training, um, had no background uh, in Judaism, Torah, the law. You were supposed to be steeped in Judaism before you even got near the teachings of Kabbalah. So um, that was unusual. Um, we were um, prepared for these teachings by doing different exercises that enabled us to come into the present moment, you know, to look at our conditioning, come into the present moment. Jason, as uh, you interviewed him, talked a little bit about his own Zen background, meditation background, and his studies um, before he started teaching this. And um, I was just so attracted to the teachings that I read many books on my own and started to explore it parallel to the school, you know, reading a lot, look, looking at different teachers. Um, and what most surprised me is that it, it really is a living tradition. Um, as we encountered the teachings, um, they came alive in the room. They weren't just book teachings. And a lot of Kabbalah is taught symbolically and intellectually. Um, we were taught experientially and it became very real to me. 
Um, I don't know if you want to put up the diagram of the tree of life. Um, we could, it is up so people can see that. There, we worked with these qualities of the tree of life, which you could see in the circles. There are 10 circles, which are called spherot. Um, and they represent different divine attributes. You could say that in the Kabbalistic tradition, it's said God used to create the world, the cosmos, um, all of manifest duality came out of the combination of these 10 spherot. And if you look on top, the first one, Keter, is paired um, below with the 10th one, Malchut, um, and they're paired in a central column. And there's two side columns. And the two side columns are complementary to each other. They're not quite opposite, but they're complementary or polarities. Um, the right side, which is the Hachma Hesed Netzach side, is considered the feminine, and the left side, the Bina Gavura Hod side, is considered the masculine. So you have a masculine, feminine, yin yang kind of pairing, and then you have a central middle column. And a lot of um, other teachers have compared that a bit to the chakra system or the Ida and Pangala Nadis. Um, I think they're really different systems with some overlaps and sim similarities, but they have different origins. <clears throat> so um, we learned how to probe and understand our own conditioning and inner life using these qualities. And then we learned how to do healings using these qualities and transmit them through our hands. And it's a pretty profound modality that has changed how I look at the world, how I look at myself. And it's really helped me look at the people I'm in relationship with in my healing practice. It's given me a um, way to look at patterns in people's lives and, and quickly understand underlying um, conditioning, I would say. And Jason taught it in a very relational matter, manner, and um, it gave me the uh, platform, I guess, of not fixing people, that I, I, I learned how to be more in relationship to people's suffering than having to fix it. And, and that's been really great. It takes a lot of pressure off me as a healer, and then things heal in and of themselves out of the condition of relationship. My only exposure to Jewish mysticism, apart from, you know, maybe interviewing Jason and one or two other people, was a, a book about the Baal Shem Tov that I read back in the 70s or something. And he was like a character you'd find in Yogananda's book or in the life and teachings of the masters of the Far East. I mean, he was really a far out guy, a Siddha, basically. Um, yeah. And I don't know if he was a, a one off, you know, and that, 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 that such people are not otherwise found in, in the. Kabbalistic tradition, or whether there was a time long ago when uh, the focus was on enlightenment as we would currently understand the term, and, and there were many examples of people developing it as a result of that um, study. Well, um, if you look at rabbinic history um, up until the Holocaust, I would say, we have a long history of I would say enlightened sages. You know, there's a lot of teaching stories about those sages. Um, the lineage was decimated in the Holocaust and previous inquisitions. Um, the most current one, I think, um, was Schneerson, who had a lot of those. He, he was like a Baal Shem Tov of his time. Um, and he was in Williamsburg, I think, until the 80s. I think he died in the 80s. Um, but it's a lineage of light. It's still a, a living tradition and people are still contributing to it in our current times. Um, I know it's somewhat fashionable. People like Madonna have gotten into it and all, but is it something that you think can be resuscitated and uh, really blossom and, and be a, it is a vibrant still, path for people? It is a vibrant path for okay, people. Um, the problem is, is that it's very cryptic. And it would you really need a teacher 
um, even to just decipher what where the path is. Um, right now, I'm currently studying Zohar, which is a mystical text from the 13th century, with Professor Daniel Matt. I'm taking an online oh, course. His brother and, lives um, here in uh, Fairfield. Yeah. David. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And David's online sometimes with us. Um, and, you know, even though it's kind of, Dan Daniel, first of all, translated it from Aramaic and Hebrew, and that was a 20-year project, but um, even though it's very intellectual, there's a transmission from the text that is very palpable. And because I already have a background in Kabbalah, I'm getting kind of a juice from it that is below the surface. You know, I'm getting a transmission just from studying it. Yeah, plus everything else you've done must make you more open to, you know, getting into the, the heart of things when you put your attention on them. Yeah, the concealed within the revealed uh, <laughs> words. Yeah. yeah, nice. Okay. Um, um, I think I should just say one more thing. The, sure. The, the Jewish slash Kabbalistic path is a in the world path. It's not a, necessarily a transcendent path, although there are transcendent teachings within Kabbalah. Um, I, I believe that you can ascend the tree of life towards the top, Keter, which is unit of consciousness, of course. But the path emphasizes being in the world and bringing divinity in the world through your life through the path of go doing good deeds in the world, which are called mitzvot, through study, through helping other people. It's a very much in the world path. Yeah, I would sort of distinguish between um, monastic and you know, householder rather than transcendent versus in the world, because a, a householder, a person in the world can very much be established in the transcendent and function from that level of awareness. Um, uh, outer lifestyle is a rather superficial consideration, you know, in a way. Yeah. But there's still this um, idea in Judaism of repairing the world through your good deeds. It's, it permeates Judaism that we're here to, to really do something in the world. You know, it's not just your own little world, it's the world at large. Oh, that's good. I mean, we have a whole category of guests on, on BatGap on our categorical index page about spiritual activism. And there are a lot right. of people who feel like, you know, we should do something with this spiritual awareness that, that we're developing. And, you know, actually not just sit in a cave with it, but, you know, um, tr channel it into some, some humanitarian or environmental or some other thing that helps people on a concrete level. Right, and like karma yoga, yoga, the Jewish path starts there. You know, that's that's a given. You start with that. Yeah, and of course, in the Sanskrit, there's the word seva, which usually means mm -hmm. selfless service, and it's considered a really potent and important um, thing in 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 many spiritual paths and by many spiritual teachers. Right. Good. So. Do you see examples of that and people who are uh, in that tradition, the Kabbalistic tradition, or is there a, are they engaged in various helping projects and things? Well, my own local rabbi is pretty amazing in that category. Um, rabbi Arthur Gross Schaefer um, unfortunately lost his son a few years back who was a twin um, through, through a drunk driving accident. And um, I think he was always doing that kind of save in the world, but right now he's fostering Palestinian-Israeli dialogue in the name of his son. And he does all sorts of other marvelous things here in our community. Um, so he's a really good example. Great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, anything more you'd like to say about Kabbalah? Well, um, I, I love the teachings. I love the training. I was doing uh, teaching for Jason for many years, and um, I thought it would be the rest of my life. I was well on the teacher track. I was being groomed to take on um, more responsibility. And um, I, I came I to just want to interject that I think I heard, I read in your book that Swamiji of, of the Patanjali Kundalini Yoga Care mentioned that you had actually been in some kind of 
um, Jewish esoteric group way, way back, the, the Essenes or Desert, yeah, let me desert get Fathers. To that or, you want to get to that group. later? No, in about one minute, just okay, to good. say Go that. <laughs> um, doing quite well, like my career track was on track, practice was good, teaching, everything great. And I started to not feel well physically. I got a kind of burnout feeling, um, enough to start to investigate it medically. And there was nothing medically wrong with me. Um, I, at the time, thought I might have had chronic fatigue or something. And um, around this time, Jason had introduced a practice, a kind of moving non-dual practice that he calls um, impersonal movement. And everybody liked the practice except me. <laughs> I had a hard time doing the practice. Um, it produced a very burny feeling in my head and it was really uncomfortable. And I could see the school moving in that direction and I was uncomfortable doing one of these new major practices that was going to continue in the school. Um, and it started a process of inner questioning, like was something wrong with me? Was something wrong with the practice? Um, my whole life was tied up with the school at that time. And I started to pray from really the depths of my soul for help because I didn't really know what to do. Um, and within two weeks of praying, um, I went to see a lecture from it was turned out to be Swamiji on Kundalini, but it was just like a, you know, okay, I'll go to that lecture kind of thing. And when I met Swamiji in the physical, I realized my prayers had been answered. That the answer I was looking for had to do with a difficult Kundalini rising. And um, during the course of this um, lecture, I met Joan at the same time, Joan Harrigan. Um, they presented how the Kundalini works in the subtle body. They presented the teachings of their lineage. And uh, sometime during the second day of lectures, Swamiji started to talk about uh, the Vajra rising, which is one of six different ways the Kundalini can um, progress through the subtle body system. And I want to emphasize one of six different ways because my book talks about my process, which is only really one type of process. And it was a particularly challenging process. And um, Swamiji at that uh, time said it was a left path, a left path rising. Um, and he called it the sex rising because the rising starts at the genitals, then it descends towards the base of the spine. So it starts at Swadhisthana and goes down to towards Muladhara, the first chakra. And then it goes straight up, um, but not through Shashumna, the central channel. It goes through the Vajra Nadi. And the Vajra Nadi um, supercharges the second chakra and brain centers. And he so told it kind of me it skips all the intermediate chakras. Right. And it gives the person a very um, it gives the person good intelligence. Um, you can have a lot of occult and astral experiences. You can have the gift of healing. Um, you won't have the gift of full enlightenment because it bypasses the the chakras and doesn't go into makara point which i'll explain in just a minute which is an upper agnya chakra about right up here and you need that to be pierced by kundalini as she progresses upwards to the top of the head and vajra rising will not give you that it gives you a lot of drama and lights and fireworks but not that and um while Swamiji was talking, I was doing a big inward groan because I kind of just recognized myself as the poster child for that rising. I had every symptom he described on the negative side, and I had a lot of the gifts of the rising. The negatives were the propensity towards sexual addiction because of the overcharged um, second chakra, uh, neurotransmitter burnout because the 
prana goes up and down a lot because of this rising. It would go up to the brain centers and then it would descend. And very often you could have um, experiences of light and then they go away really quickly and you get depressed. I, I experienced that a lot in my life. Um, what else was there? Um, astral experiences, I was having a lot of those. Um, the ease with which I learned healing. I mean, it kind of explained everything, my interest in channeling and esoteric systems. Um, so at the end of the two day weekend, um, when I went to say goodbye to Swamiji, he just looked at me very seriously. He was very, very serious, but he did laugh at this point. And he said, um, what rising do you think you have? And I just said, the sex rising. And he said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, don't worry, it's easy to fix. Come to our retreat. So Let I me ask you a quick question here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Knowing what you know, when you look at certain famous figures, do you, do you sometimes find yourself uh, um, categorizing them by this or that rising? For instance, I watched a docudrama about Albert Einstein a couple of years ago, and obviously he was a very intelligent guy. He also had a tendency to head away with the ladies, so to speak. Um, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, according to this documentary. Um, well, um, as Joan said in her interview, it's, it's not that easy to figure out someone's rising. However, I would say I have really good finely tuned Vajra an antenna, and I can tend to spot that rising. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially in men. Um, Takes one I, to I know probably, one, sort of. <laughs> yeah, it takes one to know one. I probably specialized in dating Vajra men, and it is possible that the Sananda person that I mentioned had that rising and abused, you know, the get, you know, abused it basically. Do you think um, these uh, six risings are more or less equally distributed, or are some of them more uncommon than others? There's two that I know are very uncommon, and the the others are probably distributed. I'd love to know what the percentages would be. But um, the other thing I would say, like, it's a good question for Joan, um, but probably they have a very select community that came to them because um, from the people that I met, we were all just desperate for some answers. We, most of us had been on a spiritual path for many years and didn't feel fulfilled, you know, really searching and having problems. So they got that select community. I think if you had a peaceful rising that was progressing really nicely through your spiritual practice, you would not seek out Swamiji and Joan. Yeah. So it's a select community. Okay. So um, I, I just want to add that uh, we'll, we'll get into it. We'll, we're going to discuss the whole thing with Swamiji and Joan quite a bit, I think, here. But um, I know of all the friends that I know of who went there, they all came back with glowing reports, you know, like for instance, last I spent a few days with Nirmala and Gina, um, who both been on Back Gap last October, and uh, they both said that now when they meditate, they just go into Samadhi, thoughtless, pure awareness, and for the whole right. time, and then and eventually come out again. But um, that, yeah. that hadn't been happening to them before. I would say I have the same experience, but I don't know those two people. Uh -huh. so. they, they went there to the Tennessee and all. Um, yeah, but let's talk about the progression because sure. um, I, I learned so much again about the function of the subtle body and at least two stages of process that can be talked about, um, which are helpful benchmarks for spiritual seekers. Um, so in order to do a retreat, I had to write about a report about my physical, mental, emotional, spiritual experiences. And then that report was reviewed to determine the rising, even though Swamiji did kind of know. There was, I'm sure, subtle things they learned about me through the description, you know, in the 12 page report that I wrote. And when I did arrive for my first um, two week retreat, um, Swamiji did tell me that I had come into this life with that rising um, and it was stuck at the throat. So it wasn't at Muladhara, the, the rising had elevated already to the throat chakra, but it was stuck. 
Yeah, now and, this brings up an interesting point. Let me just throw it in here, which is that one can have had a kundalini rising or kundalini awakening in a previous life, perhaps even quite a few lives back, and it just kind of carries over from you pick up where you left off in your next life, and it can go through a series of progressions or perhaps declines uh, from life to life. Right, and also I should just simply define kundalini not being energy, but being the divine force of awakening within every single person. So this force exists in every person despite what upbringing you've had, what spiritual path you've had. Um, and they don't talk about it in Advaita Vedanta. They don't focus on it. Um, so despite that lack of focus, it still exists. And if you came into this life with a very elevated rising, you will not have experienced some of the stages of Kundalini process. So you might not ever talk about them in your own awakening process, um, which is really important because some teachers just have never experienced, you know, the rising progressing yeah. and others have. True. And it's funny how people sometimes tend to just dismiss or utterly reject those things which they haven't experienced. You know, and it's also interesting that a person can have a very profound degree of awakening, in my observation, uh, you, you know, some kind of unity consciousness state, and yet be kind of muddled up in terms of their understanding of things. Um, I don't think that awakening necessarily confers a very th clear, thorough, nuanced converse, uh, understanding of various um, subtle mechanics of, of the creation or of the body. Right, nor of your own personal psychology or early conditioning. Um, and you can still have rather large chunks of process to do after a unit of experience. And I know you've interviewed people who have actually talked about that, where it comes up later, post-unity post experience. Um, so I did want to talk about um, Makara point because it's not something I had ever heard of before I went there and um, it's considered actually the the real opening to the spiritual path the it it, it happens in upper Agnya chakra when the kund Kundalini elevates and pierces a hard cap that sits right in the middle and for the Vajra rising person Kundalini actually has to descend first. It's not just an upward process. It, it, she actually has to descend, go all the way back down to the first chakra at Muladhara, and then kind of re-enter enter for the first time, Shashumna Nadi, and then ascend. I see. So, and, the, so the, for the Vajra rising person, Kundalini has risen, but not through Shashumna, through one of the side Nadis. Right. Is it called the Vajra Nadi? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So it's kind of gone up the wrong channel, so to speak. Right. And the Vajra Nadi is used by all human beings for in the process of having an orgasm. So therefore, the relationship to sexual experience and the orgasmic experience and over-interest in sex, it might have been actually a left a left-handed process, you know, in Tantra. I'm not sure about that. But... Um, It is, it is considered, it, it has to move into the central column for process to continue. And they gave me practices um, that were very, very gentle yoga practices to enable that shift to happen. And that shift happened on the second day of my retreat. Um, so the practices facilitated that shift and it was a very palpable shift. I experienced my consciousness um, going upwards through a kind of dark purple hole in a green field that I could see on my mind screen. And it was just an all of a sudden like push of consciousness upwards. And it was very bliss filled. It's what everybody wants to have happen. Um, you know, it was one of those experiences. And instead of lasting a long time, I was in the second phase, but within 24 hours, I had moved into the next phase of process, which is 
restoration and renovation of your whole subtle body. And um, mine had a lot of, I don't know, bells and whistles. Like the first morning of practice after that, uh, there was a lot of writhing and movement. Um, they're called kriyas in Kundalini process, where my whole body went into a spontaneous yoga posture and it felt like I was throwing up dark stuff, dark energy that just got purged out of me. Um, and I had actually five years of continuous kriyas of different kinds um, with that came up with practice. So at that time, I was just so fascinated by what was happening inside that I committed to doing practice, you know, it, this wasn't magic. You were given a practice and expected to do the practice. And um, during the retreat, we did the practice, which was over an hour and a half long, four times a day. So you can imagine that that's a lot of practice. And at home, I would do it once or twice a day, about an hour and a half. And um, I thought, you know, okay, renovation, restoration, this will be over pretty quickly on to the next phase of enlightenment. But instead of that happening, uh, it took a long time. It, it really took years and years to actually get my damaged, subtle body in good enough shape to support the progress of Kundalini. And not everybody has such a damaged, subtle body. Mine was damaged because of the deflected rising and poor lifestyle choices, I would say, in terms of the sexual stuff and... Um, just um, overusing my prana as an energy healer. So my life had a change and it had a, I had to eat differently. And just, I just went into a very quiet meditative um, lifestyle of practice um, for over 12 years. You had a Swiss cheese subtle body, right? A lot of holes in it. Holes in the bucket. <laughs> and it was kind of surprising to hear that because I had had lots of healings. It was a little bit disillusioning to hear that. Um, but nevertheless, um, I would say the roughest part of the process was for the first five years. I felt lonely at different times. Uh, we weren't in a community where we were comparing notes. Um, I went on about one retreat a year to get my practices upgraded. And I took 12 years of notes about what was happening in my inner process. And Swamiji always asked for the notes um, and could determine what our next practice should be to keep the process moving, but on the basis of our practice notes. And that's a really rare situation for any seeker to have, um, you know, a master upgrading your practice about once a year or yeah, so. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah. Um, this whole topic of subtle body is interesting because, I mean, think of all the people in mental hospitals who are psychotic or something and um you know or sitting in with psychiatrists on a regular basis and uh, usually they're given some kind of drugs these days and and their whole malady is is considered neurophysiological there's usually no consideration of any such thing as a subtle body but very likely what's going on and there may be some neuro neurophysiological factors but that's just the tip of the iceberg very very likely what's going on is a subtle body that, and a whole Kundalini situation that's really out of kilter. Um, and, you know, if we really want to get to the root of the problem and you know, enable them to restore them to health, then that's somehow going to have to be addressed. There ultimately should be therapies available on, on a widespread basis to uh, offer that kind of thing. I wish that were so. Um, Maybe someday. But unfortunately, it's not. <laughs> and, you know, both Swamiji and Joan really emphasize the necessity of having a stable mental life, stable physical life, stable emotional life, um, right food, um, right, right way of living as the foundation for Kundalini process. So it's also possible that um, mental conditions really need to stabilize before Kundalini is going to stabilize you know what i mean it's you have to you would really need both you'd need a lot of discernment 
You know, these days, uh, well, in a couple of weeks, I've got to interview Michael Pollan, who wrote a book called Changing Your Mind, you know, How to Change Your Mind. It's on the shelf behind me for, about psychedelics. And mm -hmm. um, he's going to be on with Chris Bosch, who was on the show about five years ago. And on, on the positive side, there, there's really good things happening with psychedelics. Um, there's research at Johns Hopkins and NYU where alcoholics and people with chronic depression are... Uh, undergoing huge improvements after one or two sessions, um, usually high dosage, very carefully supervised sessions. On the other hand, uh, you know, psychedelics have been notorious for really screwing people up. Uh, and these days, ayahuasca is all the rage and a lot of people are going to South America to do that. And there have been some, you know, some train wrecks uh, as a result of that. Um, so, I mean, what is your sense of psychedelics? Do you think that um, if used very uh, responsibly and judiciously and under proper supervision, they could actually have a healing effect on the subtle body? Or do you think that in a way we're kind of borrowing from our bank account for, by, uh, by using them at all and that there's gonna to have to be repair work done later on? I don't think there's um, any one answer. It's, it's really individual to the person. I've seen the train wrecks in my healing practice where there's so much damage to the subtle body and the brain itself. And I've heard some amazing stories where some people have snapped out of depression and um, had a vision of God, their, their life's different ever since. Um, I've seen both. It would be great if somebody with subtle sense perception could be on hand as well as a medical doctor and you could do it in a way to really monitor you know, the process. I know Ram Das said something about being really sorry that LSD went mainstream so quickly because the research that he foresaw happening never really happened. Yeah, Michael Pollan talks about that in his book. He kind yeah. of uh, blames uh, Timothy Leary to a great extent because Leary just went nuts with it and the whole culture, you know, the whole culture went crazy and Nixon yeah. proclaimed Leary the most dangerous man in America. And, you know, so there was some really promising research taking place and it, it got, you know, clamped down. Yeah, I think it depends on, you know, the condition of the subtle body and the person receiving it, their karma, all the stuff. The same with the Kundalini rising. Um, the six different risings and the person's condition when they start practices um, really inform how you're going to experience the awakening process. Yeah. And it really accounts for all the varieties that we hear about. Um, so I had a bliss-filled makara experience. Someone else might not have had any experience, and still it went through that makara point. It can be extremely subtle, or it can be, you know, a very sacred experience, um, which it was for me. It felt very, very sacred. Like, wow, this is real, you know, like that just happened. <laughs> Whereas later on, there wasn't an experience to remark about. This was, was an experience that, you know, was remarkable, I would say. Um, and then um, during the years, I was very interested in Kabbalistic meditations. I had been pursuing them on my own. And I was doing meditations with the Hebrew letters um, and studying um, the path of letters, which is a, a path of Kabbalah where you work with Hebrew letters. Um, each Hebrew letter has an energy of it in and of itself, and it, they can be used um, in meditations that are pretty esoteric, but were quite fun for me to explore for some time. And during this time, I um, started to have more and more no-self experiences in my practice. And they were paired with uh, subtle body repair experiences. So I had lower chakra repair going on and I was having what you would call upper chakra no self experiences. I was starting to have a lot of oneness experiences. And that period went on for probably about another, I don't know, four or five years or so. Um, I seem to have passed through the next benchmark which is Bindu at the top of the head um, without one particular notable experience. It was just kind of a gliding into more and more of no self, no self, um, no experience. 
um, sometimes I would do my practice and I would just stop in the middle because, you know, like you said, into samadhi without any effort. Yeah. Um, in your notes that you sent me, you, you have a line that says a few universal spiritual milestones that are not imagination, tangible and real, that you experienced over 12 years of practice. So you know, have you already mentioned those milestones? Or That would not, be Makara that, Point. That was Makara Point, right. And then and you say universal because ultimately everybody has to go through this, even if they don't understand it or or don't remember it or don't remember it, whatever. Yeah. Which brings up an interesting point. Um, can you have? Well, a couple of questions here. One: Can you have a Kundalini awakening without even knowing it? And can it be so smooth that there's really no fireworks and and nothing flashy going on? And you know, years later, maybe somehow some authoritative person confirms that you've had it. I would think yes. Um, but there is a shift in consciousness. There is definitely a shift in consciousness. I remember in Santa Barbara, I, I was casually talking to this woman whom I guess experienced Makara Point um, at some point in her very early life. And she noted it as remarkable, never told anybody. I mean, she told me about it because we were talking about awakening. Went on to have a family. She never became overtly spiritual, was never on a path. She just let it unfold in her life. And really beautiful woman. And I'm sure there's people like that out there. Do you think that people who have a lot of fireworks going on and who have difficulties and all, it's it's mainly because there is damage in the subtle body or there are blocks in the nadis or something. And that if the subtle body is in pretty good shape and there aren't such blocks, then then you won't have as much flashy stuff. Yes, and it depends on whether you also have two of the deflected. There's two deflected risings, and they tend to be the risings that produce the fireworks. Um, you know, I was never a candidate for Vipassana, which I did do. I went on a 10-day Vipassana retreat, but I had a proclivity for the fireworks, so I almost needed to have, you know, the the teachers I did to come out of that and and have... I, you know, it's, it was almost a disappointment for me to go into no self, no fireworks, what? This is spiritual? I had to get over the, the esoteric stuff and the phenomenal stuff and really practice resting in, in that unitive want no self state, um, which I really like a lot right now, but it took some time to get over a little bit of a disappointment, <laughs> no fireworks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. I have a friend who's probably watching this who went through a, a very intense um, Kundalini awakening phase. I mean, really intense. And um, she feels that, you know, there's you know, some neurons were fried in the process. And, and in certain senses, she may never be the same, even though she now feels like she's very solidly awakened uh, and abidingly, you know, for years now awakened. But she feels like some damage was done. Um, does that ring true to you as a possibility? Um maybe what i would say is kundalini requires brain support um one thing i didn't mention is that we were given ayurvedic oils we were given Ayur ayurvedic herbs um sometimes food remedies our, our diets changed so i had a lot a lot of support on the physical level for kundalini process um during the retreats we put oils on morning and evening to take out the toxins from the subtle body, actually physical oils, head to toe. Abhyangas? Uh-huh. Right. Um, I had Shiradhara a number of times. I had, um, I was on Ayurvedic supplements for a good, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Yeah. Shiradhara, um, just so people know, it's a cool thing where you lie down and they pour oil on your forehead and it's incredibly relaxing. God, you it's just... It's really wonderful. Oh. <laughs> Even that, in fact, that... There was some reporter who came to the university here to do a, a story on, and they had him do Shiradhara, and he kind of experienced transcendence just as a result of the Shiradhara, you know, no meditation or anything. It's pretty blissful. But to go back to your friend, um, because of the intensity of your friend's process, your friend might need brain support, you know, through supplements of some kind. Um, my experience is that the brain is actually repaired after Makara point. Um, Kundalini is actually directing everything from the brain centers and systematically repairing the chakra system after Makara. 
So um, to, to extract a question from that, could you say that you couldn't go much beyond Makara unless the repair took place? So that repair needs to take place for, for, the pro for progression to continue. That could be true. Some people go right up to Bindu, Bindu at the top of the head and the repair happens after. That's really tough. I don't know if that happened to your friend, but that's like, you know, getting a huge dump of garbage into your subtle body that you have to process out. It needs support. I mean, that's the benefit of having a teacher. Um, really needs support. It, it can be very frightening for people. A lot of times past lives come up and they feel vibrationally real in your subtle body. Feels like you're living through it. I had that experience. Um, feels real, but isn't. Um, and the emotions and the trauma of that particular past life are healing, but you're kind of reliving it in the moment. I know people around town here who've been meditating, you know, 30, 40, 50 years whom I regard as really eccentric. I mean, they're really kind of out of it in many ways, even, even in terms of practical stuff like earning a living or anything, but you know, they, they can get, they can be off on very obsessive tangents or just you run into them in the grocery store and they run up to you and start going on about conspiracy theories or something. And I'm just wondering whether such people might have you know, be the victims of a deflected rising without knowing it and, uh, you know, obviously, it would be really beneficial if they could get the right kind of help. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know it's possible. Again, I'm asking right a lot kind of hypothetical questions. Yeah, right? hypothetical questions that really would have to be evaluated on a one on one basis. There's all sorts of stuff weird out, you know, weird stuff out there. Do they have an attachment? Do they have you know, mental illness, how do you discern the difference? Um, sometimes attachments come with mental illness, you know. By, what do you mean by attachments? You could have negative astral attachments. Entities that are of some sort. Show, entities of yeah. some sort, yeah. you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, once the Kundalini is above Makara point, there is a systemic renovation of your whole system. And you can encounter that for a very short period of time or a very long period of time, depending on your the health of your subtle body and your persistence in practice and grace, I would say. Yeah. Um, a question came in from Bartholomew in Melbourne, Australia, who asks, how long does it take to have a Kundalini awakening? What practices can you do to encourage it? And I would add, do you actually want to encourage it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I would have... I think it's over lifetimes that, as you said earlier, um, it could have started in one lifetime where there's some arousal of Kundalini. And again, Joan talks about the stages of arousal through awakening, the stages of process in both her book and your interview. But it, it happens over lifetimes. And um, there there's some yogas, Kundalini yoga, where you know, you're trying to stimulate a rising. I don't do that. Um, don't think it's a great idea. Better to pray for spiritual help and let grace do the job, you know. Yeah. Um, I know people who, you know, did stuff like really intense pranayama for an hour and things like that on a regular basis and ended up, um, you know, getting into trouble. Because, yeah, because they were forcing something rather than allowing it to come naturally when it was ready to happen. Right. And for deflected rising people, that kind of pranayama is really uh, detrimental. So I, I wouldn't recommend it at all. I just want to see something. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's another good question that just came in from Herman Sohier from Lamartinge, Belgium. Um, he asks, the reason they don't talk about Kundalini and Advaita Vedanta is because it's an experience. And experiences happen in time with a beginning, middle, and end. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, it's what we were talking about earlier. What do you do if you're in the middle of a raging Kundalini awakening or opening and you're not supposed to talk about it? It's not useful. So Advaita practices are useful post makara post bindu they're really effective inquiry practice is great for that level of awakening and for other people it's somewhat helpful um 
for me, it would not have been helpful. I, I needed exactly what I received. Excuse me. Yeah, while you're getting some water, I'll just uh, mention that yeah. I've said this before, but um, but that, uh, Advaita, which means not to, uh, is part of Vedanta, which means the end of the Veda. Anta means end. And so it's sort of the culmination of everything the Veda has to offer, and there are all sorts of different steps leading up to Vedanta that... Um, Vedanta it would not seem very Vedantic, <laughs> such as <laughs> such as yoga and and you know Ayurveda and many many other things, but they're they're preparatory, and we don't just I mean in our culture we want it now you know but um, it's not necessarily going to be relevant for us to jump to the final teaching without having gone through some preparatory stages. Not relevant for most people anyway. Right, right, and you know there's nothing wrong with inquiry process process it's wonderful but just don't avoid the rest of the process you know yeah um and i think you know really good vedanta teachers like ramana didn't um dismiss the kinds of things we're talking about today um he kind of met people well, like we were talking earlier he met people at their level uh and chances are whatever they were doing he encouraged that because it was relevant for them then it might not be relevant for them 10 years later but it was relevant for them at that time and so he didn't say no 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 you should just be doing self-inquiry and nothing else i know for sure he didn't say that because there are some quotes that i've read where he directed people uh towards a different type of practice yeah and david godman and i mm -hmm. talked about that in a couple of different interviews right uh, right okay so um, maybe I should just talk um, a little bit about uh, my own completion and what's been going on now yes, uh, please, in terms yeah. of current process. Sure. And um, so I went through uh, maybe a period of two or three years after a near-death experience um, where I was really taught by loss and grief. Um, I, I lost uh, five or six people in my life um, within two or three years that were very dear to me. Um, my parents died three days apart in 2013. I lost a best friend. I lost a teacher and a rabbi friend, my cat. Um, so I call them the death years because I was really being taught by grief and loss. And... <clears throat> At the end of this period, I was pretty worn out um, and went to Swami and, Joan, and Joan's um, place in Knoxville for what would have been my eighth retreat. And I just really went for repair and downtime because I was exhausted. Um, and during that retreat, um, you know, after doing practices again four times a day, good food, good rest, I went outside to sit outside um, at around seven in the morning and I was drinking a cup of tea and I happened to look down and I was watching a little ant that was walking around on the sidewalk with a very big parcel of something in its mouth. So the parcel was like five times the size of its body. And just as I was watching it, my mind went completely vast and clear. It, it, it just was kind of like, if I, had to, if I had to describe that, it was something that went like, no, no thoughts, no self, no person thinking. It happened from the inside out. It wasn't that I thought about it. Something opened, I, I guess, into vastness. And um, that didn't go away. It was time to do my morning practice. I was able to get up, go inside, do my morning practice. And part of my practice was a contemplation of the words, everything and nothing, and nothing and everything. Um, they come from Hebrew, the, the English comes from Hebrew, actually. There's a Hebrew relationship to those words. And um, as I did my practice, that sense of vastness kept expanding. And any sense of personal reality actually did disappear for some time. I don't know how much time, but it was definitely absent. Um, 
And I only know that because it came back. <laughs> so at a certain point in time, a sense of personal me did come back. But there, it became that that whatever that was, um, which I call that because there's just no way to talk about it. And it was rather stunning. It, it was like, oh, that's that. <laughs> you know, that is the subtrate, substrate of reality. That that is what the non-dual path talks about. It is experienceable, but you can't really talk about it. It it just is. It's it's that itself. It's isness itself. Um, everybody tries to talk about it. I'm trying, but really, there's no no words for that. Um, it became a kind of base camp, you could say, or always present um, background that sometimes unexpectedly comes very much into the foreground. And I've had a number of times consistently through the most recent years where it takes over the foreground to the point that the world disappears, I disappear, literally, no world, no me. But then the personality is still there and comes back. And um, Can you function in, during those times when it's taken over completely? Uh, not, not exactly. Not so much? <laughs> not so much. Yeah. It was really amusing. I do do weddings. I officiate weddings. And most recently, I was literally mouthing the words of the ceremony. And that background came forward. And I literally dug my heels into the earth because I, I the little I, Danny, was still doing the wedding. But whatever that was, was overtaking it. And it's not the best timing, you know? <laughs> I suppose to trust it completely would be to trust that the wedding would have continued and I would have disappeared simultaneously. But I found I really needed to ground down into my body and into the earth. Um, it's not separate from the body. I'm aware of kind of body, but it does overtake a perceptual cognition of the world at times. You know that term, it, Laisha Vidya? You know that term? No. It means... Um, uh, vidya means knowledge, avidya means ignorance, lesha means faint remains. So it means remains. it's a thing from Vedanta, which faint remains of ignorance, which is considered to be essential if this is going to be a living reality, if you're not just going to have to be spoon fed for the rest of your life. You, <laughs> you have to have, in order to function in the world, there has to be that, some appreciation of duality and a sense of self and all that. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I still drive a car, which has been to my detriment sometimes. <laughs> I've had some fender benders. So yeah, I mean, I I exercise. I, I want to. I want to. I'm in the body for right now. I exercise. I live a very human life. Um, I don't know if I'm down to traces of personality. I still have a personality, but what I would say is that. Whatever that is permeates this <laughs> consistently. And I still do spiritual practice. Um, I love spiritual practice. Um, and it is a constant running and returning. I was going to say that in Kabbalah, um, in Hebrew, there's this phrase, it's ratzov v'shov, um, which means running and returning. And that's considered what we do as humans, that we run and return to this place, you know. But it's not, it's not exactly a place. It's not exactly anything you could describe. But there is sort of a running and returning. You know, you could understand why one would say that. Yeah. In Sanskrit, there's a term called uh, this nivartatvam, which means retire. And there's this thing called the cognitions of brigu, and in which you, you retire from this and then you retire from that, and then you retire from this and retire from that. And there's this sort of cyclical thing, which results in not only integration, but I, I also think ascending stages still, even, even if a profound awakening has taken place, there's continuing, continuous room for refinement and... Um, right. Yeah. The last time I saw Swamiji, which was in um, 2014, he was talking about superior and inferior nirvikalpa samadhi. And um, inferior is when you have it when you're inside, you know, 
And superior is when you can be external and still be in samadhi um, and function, I guess. Uh, you know, the jiva mukta, the one who's in the world and liberated. And that process is still going on. I'm quite sure it's still going on. Not there yet. Um, but it's very, very, very subtle. Um, I think it was Miranda Richardson in one of your interviews kept Miranda saying... McPherson. you Oh, yeah, yeah, McPherson. She kept saying, relax. You know, you just relax into that. I really resonated with that. It's a relaxation. And questing just stopped. I mean, how, how do you quest for that? I, I, I'm not questing for anything any longer, but I still do practice. It's a relaxation into that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's certain teachers who say things like give up the search and drop the, the you know, the, the, they, they feel that if you're doing some kind of practice, you must be still a seeker, still searching. And, that, and you know, we can relate very much to that searcher, seeker energy. You know, I think we were both obsessed with that. At a certain yeah, point. <laughs> uh, but just the fact that practice is still taking place doesn't necessarily mean that that energy is still um, running the show. No, grace runs the show. Yeah, you know, it's it's definitely surrender to that. Well, at this point for me, it's really appropriate to not quest. But if I hadn't started a quest, I never, you know, would would have arrived at this point. So, you know, the quest may be illusory, but it sort of starts things, questions. It starts the questions that lead to a path, and eventually the path disappears too, right? Yeah. I think to take um, an analogy, I mean, if you're feeling miserable, then naturally there can be a sort of a desperation feeling, uh, and you really want to get out of your misery. If you start feeling pretty good and content and happy, then that desperation thing no longer fits, you know? Um, and it's like, you know, if you're homeless and on the street, you 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 really want some money uh, after a while if you're jeff bezos you know you you don't have to worry about money but you're still making it <laughs> the kabbalists say that the illusion of brokenness is created so that you can have the journey of repair and it yeah it may all be illusion but still in this game there's that journey <laughs> yeah um, a couple of questions came in from kranti in freehold new jersey my sister used to live in freehold uh, she asks, or maybe it was Marlboro. Anyway, she asks, um, what finally helped you get out of the chronic fatigue? Any tips for beginners? Oh, um, Kundalini process, uh, the repair process. Uh, it was mainly caused by the holes in the bucket. Um, the prana, my prana system was really not strong. Yeah, so you're leaking energy. Yeah. Yeah, I had previously done a lot of herbs and stuff, and they weren't helping. And I thought, well, the problem must be at some other level. Mm -hmm. And so we've been talking a lot about Joan Harrigan's place in Tennessee and all, but that's not really available right now. Um, Joan right. is sort of on leave of absence from that. So we've probably gotten people all excited about that. But what would you recommend for people who you know, want to get the kind of guidance you got? Um, to really dig deeply in, interiorly to the longing um, for God, basically, whatever you call God, reality itself, divine knowledge, divine consciousness, but to um, really pray from the depths of your heart for the exact right path, the exact right person, to show up on your journey because those prayers are really heard. You may have to knock three times before they're answered, as they say, but in my experience, I've been helped at every single stage of process. And I think what most people have gotten from my story is that my longings were answered and that I've had a lot of persistence and um, I was on a quest, you know, for some years. The, the quest has been consistent until questing stopped. So, so don't stop until you feel like you're fulfilled in your journey. Yeah, as Jesus said, you know, um, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened. And I see that over and over again, where, you know, like you did a prayer at one point, and then within two weeks you met Swamiji. And I, I see it a lot. It's like nature is very responsive if we have the sincere intent or desire. 
Yeah, and I would watch for the synchronicities in your life that put a book or a teaching right in front of you because there's right teachings for right times like we've been discussing and they do tend to show up and also don't be afraid to leave a teacher if you finished with that path there's nothing wrong with you know turning towards something else yeah or if you sense that there's something really wrong with the teacher um, especially then yeah especially then don't say to yourself well who am i to judge you know this guy seems so enlightened and i'm a schmuck you know so i should just stick around even though all these terrible things are happening right and they'll tell some teachers tell you it's your only your transference they have no play in it you know and they're doing this they're abusing you to to help you yes. learn about your transference that's yeah, not brother. true nope yeah i've, I've so, heard that yeah yeah me too um and the <laughs> second question from kranti is um from your experience healing several conditions do you see that particular ailments such as cancer are associated with particular patterns in the energy body cancer is a real interesting one um i went to a talk here in santa barbara about the genetics of it and the person said that the genome is actually different in each person with the same type of cancer so in in working with cancer patients i have also found the circumstances are different um, there has been one common denominator that I've noticed, and it has to do with overgiving to everyone else and not taking care of the self. So a pattern around nurturing versus receiving nurturance, especially with breast cancer more than male, you know, um, prostate cancer, but especially with breast cancer. Um, but you know, there's so many lessons when you go through cancer treatment. Um, from just staying, trying to stay calm and, and centered um, in the midst of devastating physical treatment sometimes, you yeah. know. That thing you said about the <laughs> genome is interesting. There have been some, there's some promising new research about very specifically targeted therapies mm -hmm. based upon the individual's particular genome and individual's particular genetics, which would, you know, is like tailor made for them in particular. And it has, you know, it's in research anyway, it's showing some really promising results without all the devastating side effects. Yeah, and also energy healing helps a lot with the side effects from treatment. That I know for sure. I've seen that. Um, and helps you get through treatment. So. Yeah. So one thing you said in your notes is that perhaps somewhere in the interview, we could talk a little bit about your NDE. Yeah. Neo-death yeah. experience. Um, I had a near-death experience in 2004 um, through a car accident and it was at, at a time when I was going through a really big transition um, from being at the healing school to I didn't know what was next. I really didn't know what was next. And I was driving on a road in Princeton, New Jersey going to a group and the car um, hit black ice and it flew through the air apparently it spent spun sideways twice in the air it went over a fire hydrant it flew between two telephone poles and it landed 100 feet in the air the airbags did not go off and i didn't remember feet any in of a field it landed in a field yeah and i only knew because somebody called the police and the ambulance and saw it um, the last thing I remember was my hands gripping the steering wheel. And the next thing that I was conscious of was consciousness itself. I was conscious. I was not aware of a body. I was not aware of Danny. I was not aware of personality. I was simply consciousness. And then at some point, I was very peaceful. I was relaxed. At some point, it was as if consciousness looked down, because obviously I was not in my body, and literally saw the body of Danny in the car. And the body was talking to a man in the car who was not in the car when I started and was laughing. God knows why I was laughing. And I, I don't know, in that split second, consciousness really joined the body. And I looked at the man in the car and I said, who are you? What are you doing? I stopped, you know, just 
said, whoa, <laughs> what are you doing in my car? Who are you? And he said, you've been in an accident. I said, what do you mean? You know, like still not really comprehending anything. And he said, look at your car. And I looked at the car and there was shattered glass. The past, the driver's side was pushed in towards my body. I wiggled my fingers and toes and figured out that they were functioning. And he said, well, the ambulance is on the way and don't move. And, you know, I went into utter panic at that point. But there was no panic in that other state. And I, in the book, I called it the peace that passeth understanding. You know, it was really peaceful and beautiful. And in hindsight, it wasn't that different from the that that I described a few minutes earlier, except this was caused by trauma, right? You know, so they were remarkably similar in hindsight, but one was caused by trauma and being out of the body, essentially. And the other was caused, you know, through years of spiritual opening and practice. Um, but what was really, really remarkable, I didn't know it was a near-death experience. I didn't see the tunnel. I didn't speak to God. But when I came to Santa Barbara, um, I got curious about it. I went to a lecture here. We have um, IAMS here, the International Association of Near-Death Studies. And I'm now on the board of IAMS. I love the group. Did you have Bill um, McDonald recently? So, yeah, uh, Bill McDonald. So somebody, I I, so. yeah, somebody told me that, yeah, I just interviewed. He's a fireman? No, no, he's a, no. he had all kinds of Vietnam stories. Somebody just told me that, anyway, I'm getting you off track. Sorry. Yeah. He's been yeah, on back maybe, up a few I'm weeks sure. ago. Yeah. Yeah, but once I heard about what near death was, I realized that even though I didn't see the tunnel, it was such a life changing experience because I really, really, really got consciousness is not anchored. It's, we're in the body as consciousness, but we're not the body. And I became really fearless for quite some time about recreating my life. I was able to move to California and um, just have adventures in life that I would have been panicky about before. I, I had a remarkable lessening of anxiety. Um, and it was very freeing on some level. It took me a long time to get connected fully back into my body, though. Yeah. Yeah, all the NDE people I've interviewed, um, you know, it's, it's been life-changing in a permanent way. It's, it was such a powerful glimpse that they can never forget it. Right. It did make me want to study trauma, um, which led to becoming a somatic experiencing practitioner. And I think it was about maybe four or five years after the accident, um, during my own sessions in training, I had to process the accident. And um, it was really interesting to see how much was still in my body, in the nervous system, in the, in the large muscles of my legs where there was a lot of bracing in the arms that had braced on the wheel. So now I work with um, somatic experiencing and I help people process trauma um, from the body upwards, you know, from the body out. Great. Um, so among, among other things, you are a, uh, a minister of some sort. And... Yep. Um, you are going to officiate in a, at, in a wedding this afternoon, and so you have to get yeah. going pretty soon. Um, so we're going to have to wrap it up, but uh, how much time do you have left? A few minutes. We're good. A few minutes. Okay. So yeah. let me know when you absolutely have to leave, because there's a few quotes from your book that I wanted to have you comment on that I thought were pretty cool. Um, obviously, there are many things in there, but these are some things that I just copied and pasted when I read them, and they're not necessarily related to what we were just saying. But... Um, for one thing, uh, Swamiji, whose name... Oh, wait a minute. Some, a question just came in. Uh, okay, no, it's not a question. Uh, Swamiji, whose actual full name is uh, Swami Chandra, Chandra Shekarananda Saraswati, um, said to you that lives with similar themes are stacked in nested layers within the subtle body like an onion. When you're ready to address their themes, they present themselves for healing. So I thought that was interesting. Have any thoughts about that? Actually, I said that that wasn't Swamiji. That was, um, oh, you said I that. learned that, yeah, from Barbara Brennan okay. times. Cool. Um, when you put energy, uh, when energy runs through the subtle body, 
um, it's likely to hit things that are stored in the subtle body and things that are stored in the subtle body are past lives. And they look like little points until they open up. And um, they can open up sequentially or not. Um, but they kind of, like I said, they open up vibrationally where you can actually see the life. You could, I had one where I actually felt like I, I was in the life, just experiencing it again. But you're in it to heal it. So you um, can see what's not complete. You could see what the trauma of that life was and have in current time have wisdom enough to learn the lesson and complete it. it in a way, it happens in current time. It's really hard to explain. It's all time at once. Mm. Um, here's another one. You were told you've been accepted back by the adepts of your lineage. And then you mm -hmm. went on to explain each spiritual path has spiritual adepts who oversee their lineage. And when our longing for God gets strong enough, they guide us step by step on our path through the channels of spirituality that are most familiar to our souls towards toward liberation. Even the most circuitous paths lead home. I want to comment yeah. on that one. Well, I had a kind of homecoming experience where I, I would say there were Jewish oriented lineage adepts, Jewish lineage oriented adepts present in my awareness. Like ascended masters or something. Yeah. 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 And I was asked if I wanted to return to my lineage. And it was very, very emotional to me because I feel like my whole life has been partly about healing my relationship to the Jewish lineage uh, due to a particularly uh, tragic past life, you could say. And I feel like it's really been healed. And in, in that vision, I said yes. And in subsequent years, the rabbi I mentioned here in Santa Barbara, um, Rabbi Arthur, um, I got bat mitzvah with him as an, a middle-aged adult with four other middle-aged adult women uh, just a few years back as a kind of bow to the lineage. Yeah, that tragic circumstance you mentioned, you said that you had a rather catastrophic fall in a, an ancient past life, which is interesting because not people don't often consider that one can have a fall from a high state, but the, the scriptures, the Vedic scriptures at least, are full of stories like that where some great Mahatma, you know, ends up still got some ego there and it trips him up and he has a big fall and then he eventually works himself back up again and so on. So interesting yeah. idea. It was something, one of the first things that Swamiji told me and it somehow rang true on a soul level. I don't know that I was any big Mahatma or anything like that, but there was definitely a fall of some sort. Interesting, yeah. actually, this next quote from <clears throat> Swamiji relates to that. He said, you are the one responsible for erasing the samskaras and vasanas. No one can do that for you. You have to do it yourself. Even swamis can fall into <clears throat> the valley of distraction. Even if you have the highest experience, the atom bomb of samskaras and vasanas can <laughs> still get you. <laughs> I can hear his voice saying that. Even if you Even have great the atom bomb. <laughs> <laughs> He gave me that warning last time I saw him. I mean, he was really adamant about that. He, he also said, you came to me saying, I keep making the same mistakes. Don't make those mistakes again. You know, he was adamant about that. Be vigilant and do your practice. And he said, you know, this last phase of practice that a number of us are in, you know, it's, you can go around the wheel like a hamster, he said, and just stay there, it's fine or you can still yearn for liberation. And I know that there's some people who don't believe that liberation is possible, um, but I do believe it's possible. It might not happen this life, it might happen at the time of death, I don't, I don't know. That's, that's you know something led by grace itself. Um, but I do believe it's possible sooner or later. There's a line in the puja that TM teachers do when they initiate somebody, which reads, at his door, the whole galaxy of gods pray for perfection day and night. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Which is to say that even if you've achieved the status of a god, there is yet possibility for perfection, further perfection or whatever. <clears throat> so, um, so, okay, so 
what can you, how can people connect with you? You know, if um, I mean, you have a number of talents, what do you offer people these days? Um, I'm in private practice. So mostly I work with people one-on-one -on, -one on Skype, phone, or in person. Um, and what do you do with them? Well, I've lately in recent, more recent years, I, I do some work with people who are on a journey of awakening. I act as um, a kind of guide. I work with people with trauma and PTSD. I work with people in life transitions, um, work with people with cancer and, and various physical problems. Um, lately, um, I started uh, against all odds because I um, don't really have a lot of musical talent. I've been leading a chanting group in Hebrew um, I completed some studies with Rabbi Shefa Gold, and I have a local group where we chant once a month, and that feels like my service to people. It, it really is very gratifying for me and hopefully for others. And um, I have one spiritual support group that we do on phone, and I would be happy to start another if people were interested. That's been a group running for over 20 years. Um, it's very small, and I would, if I started another one, I would keep it pretty small. I like small groups. Um, you might want I've to consider making it on Zoom now instead of phone, since we have, yeah, yeah you could see the people. Zoom would be great. Um, yeah, I like individual attention. You know, I've done some teaching. I have a Jewish workshop. I've been going around and teaching, but I like small groups versus large and personal groups. You know. Yeah. Good. Alrighty. Well, I think we've covered a lot, haven't we? We have. And I just want to thank you, Rick, for doing what you do. It's really important. Um, you know, this just wasn't available, you know, when I was growing up. And it's amazing that people can get a smorgasbord of all these different paths and experiences and see that from the comfort of their own sofa. Um, and then decide, I mean, if I was awakening now, I would watch a lot of videos and then see who I resonated with. Yeah, sometimes I think that, you know, that the advent of technologies, which can make spiritual teachings, um, which can disseminate them globally, is kind of part of God's plan, so to speak, for the enlightenment yeah. of the world. Like, you know, all the, all the, in the, in the old days, a teacher like Jesus could only cover you know, a certain small radius that he could walk around Shankar or walked around the whole country of India, but still, you know, it was very limited and uh, no way of recording it for, for posterity or anything. And these days we have all these marvelous technologies which can record things verbatim and which can disseminate them instantly throughout the world. I mean, we've had questions from all over the world today. And yeah. um, so I think it's, you know, it's a powerful thing for the potential and hopeful, um, awakening of the world. Couldn't happen without it. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's also amazing that the words of Jesus, or at least some of them, still survive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, nothing was written down the for a few hundred teachings. years, so you yeah. don't know, but... <laughs> you don't know, but the real teachings are, you know, you can still find truth in them. Yeah, yeah, so. you can. Good. Thank you so much for having me. All right, thanks, Danny. Um, so we'll be in touch. And yes, um, for those uh, who've been listening or watching, thanks for doing so. Uh, next week, you know, there's these, this beautiful series of movies called, one of them is called Samadhi and the other is called something else. I think I have it on the shelf back here. Eh. Can't quite see it. But in any case, that guy who made those movies is going to be on next week. I think his name is Daniel Schmidt or something. And um, then the following week, I mentioned uh, Michael Pollan and Christopher Bosch talking about psychedelics. So stay tuned for these things. If you'd like to be you know, there's an upcoming interviews page on Backgap where you can see what's on tap. Uh, and also, um, if you'd like to be notified when new interviews are actually posted, you can sign up for an email thing on the site, be notified. Um, and also, there's an audio podcast of this for those who like to listen to audios while they drive or whatever. Um, and a number of other things. If you explore around the site a little bit, you'll find them. So thanks a lot. And uh, thanks again, Danny. So Thank you. Wonderful getting to know you. See you soon. <laughs> and we'll be in touch. Okay. Bye. Bye.